I presented equivalence as a, a paradigm of translation theory that isn't as bad as people make it out to be. I presented it, I hope, as being something that's quite complex. You can have natural equivalence as a supposition. You can have directional equivalence as a supposition. You can have obligatory equivalence, as we find in terminology. Or equivalence can allow you a series of choices to make. It can be equivalent there, 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 or there. So it could be quite a dynamic, open, liberal approach to translation, I think. And it's not appreciated for that. However, there, there are some aspects that are problematic. One is that it presupposes two separate sides that are big and strong. And uh, that, that equal value is possible. And I tried to point out last week that a lot of translating in the world is between very asymmetric languages and cultures, big ones and little ones. And a lot of the translating through history has been in order to develop the little ones, going down on the medieval language hierarchy, for example. That mode of thought, that extreme asymmetry between languages and cultures, wasn't really contemplated within the equivalent paradigm. And the other problem is that the source text is supposed to be a stable entity. Something's there, and therefore, if there's a change in the source text, there'll be a change in the translation. But a lot of source texts, or the things we're working from these days, in the age of electronic communication, are not stable. Software programs, websites, are evolving all the time, and it makes more sense to see translation as part of that evolving text uh, rather than equivalent to the value of a fixed anterior text. So I suggested that equivalence was suited to Western notions of nation, of big vernacular languages and cultures, and the printed fixed source text. You don't find equivalence talked about prior, uh, well, the, the notion of equivalence, equivalence itself is, is the 1960s, but the, the notion of equal value really appears in the European Renaissance, and not prior to that, and it's not a big thing in the world of electronic communication. I, I want to approach some of the problems of equivalence by going back to one of the key texts in that paradigm, which is uh, Vinay d'Arbelay. It's called a Comparative Stylistics of French and English, two big imperial languages. Um, first published in 1958. And I'm just reading from the introduction. Okay? Vinay and d'Arbelay were two French linguists here in the introduction to their book, which is going to compare French and English. The subtitle says méthode de traduction, method of translation. They are driving along in a car. One guy drives and notes all the street signs and the other linguist writes down. And then they compare because when they get to the border between upstate New York and Canada, they start to get bilingual street signs. And here's what happens. Okay, I won't do a false French accent, but you can imagine. We soon reach the Canadian border, where the language of our forefathers is music to our ears. The Canadian highway is built on the same principles as the American one, except that its signs are bilingual. After slow, written on the road surface in enormous letters, comes lentement, which takes up the entire width of the highway. What an unwieldy adverb! A pity the French language never made an adverb just using the adjective long, L-E-N-T. But come to think of it, is lentement really the equivalent of slow? We begin to have doubts, as one, al as one always does when shifting from one language to another, when our slippery when wet reappears around a bend followed by the French glissant si humide. Whoa, 
as a low razor would say. Let's pause a while on this soft, sh soft shoulder. Okay, on the right side, soft shoulder. Thankfully caressed by no translation, and meditate on this C, this if, more slippery itself than an acre of ice. No monolingual speaker of French would ever have come straight out with that phrase. Nor would they have sprayed paint all over the road for the sake of a long adverb ending in mon. Here we reach a key point, a sort of turning lock between the two languages, but of course, par bleu, instead of lentement, an adverb, as in English, it should have been ralentir, a verb in the infinitive, as in French. End of the reading. Okay, you've got these guys driving along, they find an equivalent given to them in the roadside. Uh, slow is translated literally, slow is an adverb in English, as lentement, an adverb in French. But they say it's wrong, it's equivalent to the form, adverb for adverb, but if you're driving in France, you don't see lentement, you see ralentir, the verb, in fact the infinitive perhaps, no, the, the, the infinitive, slow down. Okay. So they're arguing that the Canadian road signs had to be fixed up. People should go to France and see what road signs are really used in the French language. Uh, you, you might appreciate, if you're Canadian or had experience of Canada, the extent to, to which this is an, an imperialist relationship, an ex-colonial relationship, saying that oh, the only proper French is spoken in France and the Canadians can not really imitate it well. Okay. You can see the choice between two kinds of equivalence. Now, the problem for me is, I, I'm not used to driving on, on roads with a lot of ice, okay? I come from Australia, we don't have that sort of thing there. We have a desert. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm interested about this uh, glissant humide, this slippery when wet. And the, the best translation for, for me would it be the one used in France, or the one used in Canada, or the United States? I don't care. Surely you can go out and see which is the best translation for reducing the number of accidents. Eh? The shorter, the better, I would suggest. Okay? Not for linguistic reasons, not for imperialistic post-colonial reasons, but what's the function of the sign? The function of the sign is to have a cognitive effect on the driver to reduce the number of accidents. And you get statistics for this sort of thing. Lots of them. So the whole equivalence paradigm was in between form and function, culture, language there, culture, language there, fixed source text, but never really got through to functionalism. What is this text supposed to do in the world? And the text here could be in the source text, but it more specifically means the translation the target text, the text you're going to produce. Now, that kind of critique became the basis for German language Skopos TLV. They started with exactly that critique of equivalence. They said, look, it doesn't really matter if you, 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 you're faithful to that or that level, to the intention or whatever. What matters, the bottom line, is what your translation has to do in the world. And that's what has to be done. Okay? 